Hello and welcome to a new episode of Oricopedia. Uh, today's topic is going to be much more technical than usual. Today I'm going to talk about this thing, the ULA HCS 117, which we found uh, in the in the Oric. The important thing about this uh, chip is that it's pretty much what the Oric is. Uh, if you had to consider only one uh, particular component of the auric has been what makes an auric, that would be that one. Uh, the rest is relatively standard, the memory, uh, things like that. And because the ULA works very differently from pretty much every other computer uh, around, uh, that's why we have a very different type of uh, graphics in auric video games. So here you have typical um, video games from the 80s. Uh, two Gun Turtles, Auric Golf, uh, Gus Gobbler, uh, Zorbon's Revenge, Manic Miner, Breakout, Leg Lodor, and Invaders by EGK Software. On the other hand, these games have been done uh, in the 21st century. So here we have uh, Boko's Adventure, uh, Pulsoids, Impossible Mission, Stormlord, uh, Elite, or 137, Blake 7, uh, Death is a demo. Uh, made uh, some years ago, and this is Magnetics. Well, as you can see, there is a very distinct uh, visual difference. If we zoom here, we can see that there is a lot of uh, details, a uh, lot of uh, color changes, dithering, small patterns, intricate graphics. We have a lot of uh, small details, like the, the keys, uh, the stars, the clouds, the moon. Here we can clearly recognize uh, library books, these are lifts that move up and down, that's uh, a lamp. Here you have a spider, you have a, a moving character. So when it zooms like that, it looks very um, pixelized, uh, but on a normal TV you don't really uh, notice the, the problem. And the same thing for all these games. Uh, by comparison, here you can see that it's yellow, bricks are in two colors, it's mostly black, there has been a color change here and there. Here the entire Pac-Man is in four colors as well. How did we go from this to that? Well, uh, a lot of things came from uh, analyzing the behavior of the, of the graphic chip, uh, mostly by people who made the first emulators. And then uh, later on there were Mike Brown, uh, who did uh, a black box, white box analysis of the chip how basically it behaves uh, in internally. So, here it's normal auric. The ULA is this chip here. And that's the only one with the ROM which is on a socket. Um, for some reason, none of the other chips are socketed. That one is because I installed it. But so here you have the ULA the basic ROM, the 6502 processor, the 6522 uh, interrupt controller, the audio sound chip, and the RAM. And the rest is just some uh, small components, which matches the schematics. And as you can see, we have the ULA in red, which is connected on pretty much all the signals uh, of the machine. The ULA actually has as many pins as the main CPU, and the main reason is that the ULA is not only the graphic chip, it's also basically the memory controller, uh, it's doing bus arbitration, refreshing the RAM, uh, giving access to things, and that's the one which also generates the clock. Um, so here we have the 12 MHz clock, uh, which is a faster clock on the machine, which arrives on the pin 7 of the ULA. And um, that's the ULA which generates the subclock frequencies used by the CPU and memory. Uh, so when the CPU is accessing things, the ULA can't access it to display, etc. Et Last year, somebody managed to find a, a company which agreed to do something called a decapping. ULA stands for Uncommitted Logic Array. And basically, that's the ancestor of things like um, uh, FPGA. Uh, this thing is a pure state machine, it does not have any register that a user can, uh, can access. Um, 
which makes it kind of a problem when you want to do advanced graphic. Like for example, you don't have a color palette, uh, you just have red, green, blue pin. It's a TTL, so it's either zero or one, which is why Zurich only has eight color. Many computers also have a vertical synchronization uh, detection, so you can synchronize the display with your code to avoid things like uh, Element on the screen being cut in two because a part is displayed on one frame and the part is displayed on the other frame. No, you can't. That being said, if you take a small simple wire that you connect on the back of your RORIC between the pin number four of the RGB output and the pin number three of the tape input, the sync signal of the ULA is going to be filtered by the tape input system and just by reading the tape register you can detect uh, 50 times a second uh, when the v-sync happens. Let's see for the people who don't really know the various graphic modes of the Auric. Here what we are interested is this area in green, blue and brown on that one there. This is the text mode and this is the high resolution graphic mode. So. Here we are in text mode, so this is 40 characters wide by 28. So the text mode is much smaller, uh, it's 8 times smaller because each of the characters is 8 pixels tall, uh, so they are compressed in memory, they are 1 8 of the, of the size. Uh, but in terms of uh, displayed pixel, it's, uh, it's the same size. And we have three additional graphic mode. We have LORES 0 and LORES 1 uh, on, on IRIS, uh, but these two are the variants. So if I do LORES 0, what I have is that. Not much difference. And I'm back in text. So basically LORES 0 is just a variant of text which is not very interesting. It's basically text in white over black instead of black over white. And we have LORES 1, which is kind of more cryptical. A, B, C, D, E, A, G, H. So it's like a special video mode where you can use uh, semi graphics uh, display. And the reason for the semi graphics display is that originally the ORIC uh, was planned to be a computer terminal to, uh, to access a video text service such as uh, Prestel and Minitel uh, in France. So if you don't know about, this is Prestel. And this is Minitel equivalent, uh, French equivalent, so British and French. Um, both systems were able to do color and uh, black and white. Uh, most people in France had a black and white uh, version, but when you con connected a computer, you could display all these things. And as you can see, something common is to have different sides of text and uh, some graphics, crude graphics done with uh, uh, some mosaics. So this was uh, LORES 1. And same thing, if we scroll, we are back to text. And then we have IRIS. Uh, so a tip which can be practical for you. Uh, the problem is that when you type command in IRIS, the ready prompt appears all the time. So if you do, uh, don't know. Uh, print yeah, the print disappears, so you can do poc one a comma ninety six, and that disables the ready prompt. So that practical in high res you can do graphics. So for example, draw two thirty nine dot one nine nine dot one, which draws a line. Curset one twenty and circle 99 and we got a circle and we can uh, change uh, color and you can also change color of course in text mode the real thing about uh, this graphic mode is that they are software construct they don't really have uh, an existence in the hardware the ORIC can display some text, the ULR can display some text, and it can display some graphics, but it does not have to be an entire screen in text or an entire screen in iris. 
uh, the machine is totally able to mix and match uh, part of the screen in text, part of the screen in iris. The big problem is, contrary to many machines, you can't move the screen address where you want. So there is an overlap between the text memory and the iris memory. So every time you do uh, complicated things, you have to be aware at all time that this particular pixel in memory you're drawing in iris matches this particular potential character in text mode. Lores 0 and Lores 1 we ignore the rest zero, it's text, uh, are using basically the fact that Zurich has two different character sets. Starting in B400, we have what we, what's called the standard character set. Every time a character is displayed, what the graphic chip is doing is to find the, the ASCII code of the character on the screen and fetch from B400 the value multiplied by 8. Uh, so if it was an A, the ASCII code is uh, 65. So what the computer is doing is that it goes to B400 plus 65 times 8, because there is uh, 8 uh, scan lines, and it knows that the A is there. Let's display A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 B, C. All the way around here, it's uh, space. If I do POC B, 400 32 times 8 1 now I have dots everywhere because 32 is the ASCII code of the space plus 32 times 8 plus 1 comma 2 now I have modified the second line and if instead I do POC B400 plus 65 times 8, 0, I'm modifying the A. And the A is gone, including in caps. And we have the same thing with Lores 1. The main difference is that Lores 1, instead of using the character set in B400, is using the character set in B800. If you're not planning to use an alternate char set, which is quite common because in most cases you don't really need it, uh, you can totally reuse this memory address there just for, just for you. And you can also redefine uh, the Lores 1 char set to do what you want. Which means that basically we have two, uh, two character sets that we can use at all time. So if I wanted here, I could totally uh, use some uh, alternate char set. So what is Lores 1? Well, I need to bring the topic of attributes, which are also sometimes called escape code. I was talking about ASCII codes, and the ORIC is following the standard ASCII code, which goes from 32 for space to 127. The 32 first uh, characters, on the other hand, uh, are actual control codes, um, which are not displayable, but which do special effect. So, if you put a value between 0 and 7, you change the color of the ink, the foreground. If you put a value between 16 and 23, in the same order, you change the color of the background, so which on the is called paper. And values between 8 and 15 are used to select the character set, like between alternate and double size. And you can do things like blinking, and you can also change the graphic mode. Let's say I want to display things there in alternate char set. I can use 9. So 
the start of the screen is BD80. So this is a byte here. I'm going to put 9. And immediately you can see that caps has uh, been replaced by uh, some mosaic. If I put back 8, my caps is back. What happens if we put 10? I get double size, which is double size to our chart set. 11 is the same thing, but with double size alternate chart set. And then we arrive in the funny things like blinking standard chart set. And 14, which is the same thing in double size. 13, which is blinking of internet. And 15. The funny thing here is that you can see a blinking uh, cursor. It is not, it, it's blinking at the same speed uh, more or less than the uh, the difference that that one is a software blinker and that one is a hardware blinker. If I was to crash the machine, that one will still blink, that one will not. And the reason is these things take room on the screen. When, we, when you put one of these codes, you can't put text. If instead of pogbb80, I put say one, now all that is red, but not that. And the blinking stopped. And the reason is I use uh, the code there and now it's not blink anymore, it's color. So if I want my blink to come back, now it's red on blinking. And you can see that there are two spaces. And that's basically the reason why we have these two lines here. Uh, when you type, uh, that's difficult with a paper four, one say six, and ink three, mm. ink uh, four, uh, nothing magical happened. Basically, what happened is that these columns here has been filled with one of these values, which means if I do poc b. 80 plus, let's say, the third line, 3 times 40, which is the number of characters. And because I want to make it blink, because I love blink, yes, it's blinking. Yes, I can still see my character in blue, but the paper disappeared. And that's why these two columns have been reserved. I have my text mode, my alternate chart set, and my standard chart set. What happens when I'm going to iris mode? As you noticed earlier, I do have three lines of text there where I can type text. And these things there, they are in the middle of the iris screen. Well, the reason is when you move to uh, IRS, these two chart sets are copied there. So the three last lines of the screen, when you are in IRS, are using chart set at this time, this location. But technically, this one still exists because at any time you can switch between IRS and text. So how does the actual IRS switch work? So let's go back to drawing a line. I have my line, I go back to text. What if I poke at the top of my screen the switch to iris mode code, which was earlier 30? And that's what we see. I have a text mode. And here I have some uh, window in graphics mode. So basically what happened is that uh, when I poked this, uh, this attribute, which I can remove uh, by putting uh, back to so it's 26, which is a text mode, 
So we, we are back. What happens is that when the, the ULA reads a byte, it interprets it immediately and does something about it. In this case, it was switched to iris. And so instead of uh, reading stuff from BB80, the video chip decided instead to start reading from A000 plus 1. Because the first byte in BB80 was switched to iris. So the next byte was A0001, because that was the start of the screen plus next byte. And if at any time a command happens, let's say poke A00 plus 40 times, let's say 50, and I put the paper color uh, blue, which is four, I have one line of blue. If instead I put a code which is go back to text, then my window stops there. And that's what explains why it stops there. Basically, this parasite you see here is where the char set are starting. And the char set happen to contain values which are interpreted uh, as some of the attributes. And one of these random value is 24, 25, 26, or 27, uh, which makes us go back to, uh, to text mode. Hello, the cat. An interesting side effect is that you have four char set you can use at the same time. For the text text part, you can use these two ones. And in the three last line of text, by default you're going with two, 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 these two ones. But if you change uh, at the last byte here in BF3F, you can force the graphic chip to use text there. Which means you can have a dedicated uh, font that you can redefine to make graphics uh, just to do something different without impacting the rest of the screen. That's what we did in uh, Quintessential. All the small text at the bottom are made uh, using uh, a full font uh, that you that. Redefine characters is probably the simplest thing you can do to make your uh, Auric game or demo looks much better. Um, here I have some examples. Uh, this is from Atanor, which was using the, the default font. Um, and this is the same scene, well, with a slightly different text, um, using handwritten uh, tracer set. It's slightly harder to read, so you have to use um, common sense uh, to do it, but it looks more like an actual game. Then you have uh, things like uh, that one, uh, the Viking Chess, Le Fatal. Uh, where we made some runic uh, style uh, character set. Here, this is from uh, Murder on the Atlantic, uh, Murder sur Atlantic, de, from Dominique Pesson, uh, which also had a standard text, and uh, we made him uh, slightly art deco style font. Uh, the game is in the early. Uh, of the 20th century, so it kind of makes sense. So all you need to do, really, if you want to make your own game, you make a small bitmap like that, uh, with uh, your 6 by 8 uh, size characters, and you can just use one of the multiple tools, uh, like Pictrong, uh, to convert that to a binary blob that you can just load in the B400, and then immediately the game takes a different style. On here, what we have is uh, Invaders from EGK Software. Uh, the game is actually in text mode. And so here you have uh, most of the characters which are still there, but few of them have been redefined to be uh, the small tank at the bottom, the small bunker with the various stage of destruction. And these are the various parts of the bloop, 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 aliens that move up and down. 
And this thing here is uh, the spaceship that move at the top that you have to shoot. To, to shoot. Um, so yeah, nothing, uh, nothing special. It's uh, quite a simple way of doing things. And I think I covered most of the things in terms of how the system works, but I'm going to show you now some actual games on demos screens on how they were built. So recently Team Raxis released Flappy Auric, which is a port of the Flappy Bird. Um, it's text mode, nothing special. The bird is in a Cyan, magenta, sorry, on the cyan background, and then we have the pipes which are green and red. This is, and I did not look at the code, so I may be totally wrong, but if I was to do it, that would be entirely text mode. You can see that every other element matches the grid, and the way they achieve the two colors is that the paper here is cyan. The ink, probably in the second column, is uh, switched to magenta, which gives us the bird and the small stars. And to be able to uh, display the, the pipes without any uh, color clash, they are just using the invert video, which I did not speak about. All this code goes from 0 to 127, and there are actually 8 bits on a byte, um, which means it can have up to 256 values. But on the Auric, uh, the most significant bit, the bit 7, actually means invert video. And invert video is done on the three components, red, green, blue, uh, and you invert them. So black, which is 0, 0, 0, give you white, 1, 1, 1. Red, which is 1, 0, 0, give you cyan, 0, 1, 1. Green give magenta, yellow give blue, blue give yellow, magenta green, ancient red, and white, and black. It's a common thing on the Auric to choose colors which are going to complement nicely to give you the missing colors. So to have the pipe in red and green, all it needed to do was to invert cyan and magenta. The problem being that uh, the invert bit applies to the entire graphic unit, so in this particular case you can't have a part of the pipe inverted and a part of the flappy bird not inverted, which is uh, a problem, but in this particular case it's not really an issue because when this happens you will die. Uh, so basically that's a game over condition and you're not going to see the conflict, so that's a perfectly valid choice. The next candidate is Xenon 1. Uh, which is recognized as one of the very first, uh, among the very first very good game on Zurich, uh, but it's not without any defect. Um, most of the time you don't notice any problem because the game is relatively fast and you are concentrated enough in trying to uh, survive, uh, more than uh, trying to actually see the glitches. But uh, after playing with the emulator for a while, I managed to capture a case there. So, as you can see, there is a black outline on the sprite of the bird, which hides a part of the bird here, uh, because it's not masked, so it's a first glitch. And the second glitch is that uh, the birds are supposed to be green at the bottom, magenta in the center, and cyan on the top, which is okay for that one, but the one on the right are being impacted. So the way the game does things is that it puts attributes color change on the left side. The one for each of the other sprites has been overwritten by that one. So here we have the cyan, probably here, the magenta there, but this here has been erased, as you can see in the corner there. Uh, so the cyan we see here and here is actually the rest of the horns, or here, so I don't know, of the bird. So that's a difficult type of uh, game to achieve, it's moving sprites with uh, attributes uh, all around. Then we have Hob 3. So I choose Prop 3 because it's an interesting example of a game which does the same thing as uh, Xenon, which is uh, embedding attributes uh, in the display. But because the sprites are so big, there is zero glitch. Um, the few cases of glitch that could happen is when you die. 
So if you look there, they put some black around here, so you can put your color change on the left, no problem. So these two lines are using cyan, all this line is in red, all this line is yellow, all that one is in red. There are no, uh, no possible conflict. Same thing on the spaceship, on the small spaceship. On the big spaceship is, is relatively smart, they aligned the, the graphical element to be on block boundaries. So there is no conflict. Uh, basically, here we have a yellow ink, here we have a magenta ink, and here is where the attribute to change ink to magenta is stored. Here we have something similar, except there are probably some cheating. So that one's probably uh, either ink or red paper followed by yellow paper followed by red paper. But basically they can do whatever they want. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if we look, we will maybe notice that some of the stars are changing color, but it's part of the game design. The stars are blinking anyway, so you, you don't see anything. That one is an interesting case, Ghost Gobbler. Uh, I actually originally thought that the game was in, uh, in text mode, because if you look at it, everything is perfectly aligned on the, on the grid. But it's actually in a high res. And it's basically using a variant of what a Flappy Bird is doing, which is the paper is magenta, the ink is yellow, which gives us uh, all the small dots, uh, the Pac-Man and the Ghost. Um, and by using uh, inversion, it gets the green and the blue. So here I isolated uh, one particular skyline, the one in B158, uh, which is uh, line number 111. <coughs> And you can see that we have some black, some green, some magenta, some dots, some space, blue, and then some ghost. And here I use the debugger of Recutron to actually check the, the content of the memory. So at the line B158, we have 0, 3, 12, 40. So these values are not in decimal, they're in hexadecimal, so I translated there. 3, 3, 12 hexadecimal is 18. And if we look our, in our um, attribute table, we know that 3 is a code for yellow ink. So this first byte here in black is yellow ink. Then we have 12, 18, which is green paper. As we can see we have green paper. Then we have 40. 40 is a neutral character uh, for, the, the graphic, uh, for the graphic mode, which, by the way, I absolutely wanted to show that. So every time you go to iris and go back to text, not sure if you notice, but there are some uh, arrobas. Yes, that was fast enough. So basically, uh, 64 is a neutral character for the iris mode. And as it happens, 64 is also the ASCII code of this character. Uh, so when uh, the ROM try to switch back to text. Uh, instead of replacing the 64s in memory by some neutral character, like for example black paper, uh, it uh, puts the attribute to change resolution, and then for one frame or two frames, you briefly can see uh, all these characters being interpreted not in iOS anymore, but as in text mode. If you want to do things correctly before switching back uh, to, uh, to text, make sure to, uh, to clean the, the screen by putting uh, neutral values, and it's going to be horrible. Or redefine the arrobas character to be a space, which will also work. We have 40, which is a neutral character, and then we have 95, which is the value 149. And 149 is above 128, which means it's an inverted, uh, inverted value. Uh, so you remove the 128, which gives you basically magenta paper change inverted. So I don't know why the guy did that. I'm pretty sure that it was possible to do exactly the same display without being so complicated. But basically this green block here is not green paper. It is inverted magenta paper, which he reused there. I'm not sure why he did that. Then you have uh, 43, 
which is value 37, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. That's all these small dots. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's the small dots. Then we have 40, which is another uh, space. And then we have BF. And BF is 191, which is also uh, above 128. And if you remove the 128, which means it's inverted, it's basically displaying the same thing as this magenta block, but it's basically doing the inverted uh, yellow, which gives you the blue. So that's it. You get your four colors just by changing colors and inverting them. And there is a bit more change here, like score is used with a there is an attribute change for cyan there for having the score. Here some white, here some cyan, and here some white. And this is just some standard uh, green attributes to get the leaf and red attribute to get uh, the fruit. AIC, which means alternate inverted colors, uh, which was uh, display mode designed by Jonathan Bristow, uh, also known as Twilight which is a smart way to get colors, possibly to mask things so you don't have these black outlines uh, corners, without having any attributes anywhere. So the way it works is that instead of having an entire set of colors for the entire screen, you use two sets of colors. Generally, you keep the paper black, and then you use two ink colors. You're going to alternate every skyline. line which are designed to be complementary to give you the color you want for your game. So you don't have to follow Jonathan's uh, color choice. Uh, some other alternative has been done, which worked nicely. Here we have black. We have only one color, what, only one lost column. And the reason is we don't change the paper. And paper is always black by default. Uh, something I forgot to mention, on ink is always white by default. So all it's doing there is to change the color of the ink. Every line, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, which gives us these interesting patterns. Black, cyan, white, red, white, red, black, cyan. Black, yellow, white, blue, black, yellow, white, blue. And if you look, All these graphical elements, they are all using exactly the same color. Yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, blue, white. And you don't have to use all the two colors all the time. So um, if you invert only your six pixels, you get full white. But you can also have a full cyan, a full yellow, partly yellow, a full red. So there is quite a lot of, uh, of freedom in what you can do. Uh, after it's just a matter of having uh, enough imagination uh, to do things. Uh, the reason why uh, black is generally kept is that you can easily do uh, black outlines to uh, help differentiate the sprites. You can see like that. Um, but yeah, basically that's AIC. <coughs> the one big constraint is that uh, you can only use this set of colors aligned on a column because the invert bit has to be aligned. Uh, so you could not have that half shifted by three pixels. That would not work. Which is why all these things are nicely aligned. Uh, so these ones are not aligned because they use black uh, as a boundary. Uh, but you could not have cyan white on the same block of six pixels. But yeah, so that's AIC, and that one has been used a lot uh, recently. Stormlord, School Days, Impulsible Mission, Boku's Adventure, they are all using this, uh, this system with different uh, color palettes. And some people were wondering about <coughs> this uh, weird graphic mode uh, used in uh, the Defense Force demos. Um, uh, how we managed to get that many colors displaying that fast? The thing is, if you look at it from far, yes, it looks like it's very colorful, but on the screen there is only four colors, and I can prove it. There is red, 
there is blue, there is green, there is black, and there is white. And the perception of colors only comes from the fact that when you are far away or on a screen, uh, which is a fuzzy or a big screen, uh, it all melts for you. So basically, what I did is that I did a variant of the half iris, half text, except instead of doing it top, I did it on vertical. So at the start of each of the lines, I switched to high res. That's the H. So we start in BB80, we switch to high res, and then uh, the next byte is going to be read in A0001. And this byte in the A0001 contains the code 1, which is change ink. And then in A0002, we got an attribute switch to text. And so we are there in BB83. BB80, BB81, BB82, BB83. And we are back in text mode. <coughs> These characters are white because I was using the inverted black uh, characters to display my text. But it was just uh, for fancy. Um, L is just normal uh, standard character, which I redefined to do some uh, patterns. Uh, which, depending of the ASCII code, give you give me different numbers of pixels intersecting the red skyline, the blue skyline, and the green skyline. And so, basically, I can do some low definition, desert, uh, pseudo color uh, with sixty four different uh, values. Uh, um, and I do that on all the line. We are in text mode, and then we are back here which is also switch to iris, rinse and repeat. Which is why we are missing three columns on the left instead of the usual two, and why there is nothing at the bottom here. It's all black. The reason is these three lines of text don't have any... Uh, they don't exist, they don't map in iris, so there is no way to change colors. Uh, here I could only change the color by block of eight. By switching to iris, I was able to change the ink color every skyline, not only every character. This part and this part, they're actually the same. Drawn twice. Uh, so it's not actual uh, pixels I've drawn, I've just been bashing uh, paper, paper color change. Black paper, black paper, black paper, green paper, red paper, cyan paper, blue paper. The advantage is that by doing that you don't have any uh, color conflict, it's just immediately changing. But color change attributes are the only thing which is exactly the same in iris on text. So if you put uh, 16 plus 1 in text, you get a big red block of 6 by 8. And if you put 16 plus 1 in iris, you also get the same thing, except instead of being 6 by 8, it's a 6 by 1. The screen is 28 lines tall. Minus 3 here you get 25 lines. Uh, and if you look, uh, this thing is about three characters tall, eight plus eight plus eight. What that means is that this um, area of uh, the iris screen actually match the entire text mode. So basically this is being redrawn by the ULA because I switched back to iris just when I was done drawing my rasters. And then I switch back to text just after. Um, the graphic chip just happily redraw exactly what he's been redrawing first. Um, so yeah, it's actual uh, replication, uh, duplication uh, of the screen. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. There are a lot of other things we've been done. Uh, on there are games like uh, Psychiatric or Tendre Poulet which are using some interesting variant of alternative colors, but pretty much none of them use either the full AIC. Uh, most of the game which use invert don't do it uh, with uh, actual attributes on the left side. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there is a lot of things that can be done. So in the description, uh, I've put links to all the demons and 
if you intend, if your developer and you really intend to do some uh, some graphics and try to, to dig a bit more, uh, I recommend that uh, you read the article uh, on the OSDK uh, article uh, papers, and also that you check the source code of the various demos and games you've been released. Don't try to reinvent the wheel uh, before actually knowing what the state of the art of the wheel is. Uh, there are regularly people who arrive in the record and say, yeah, I'm going to reinvent the universe, and then they look at things and this is more complicated than expected. Uh, so take your time, look at the topic, look at how things are done, ask questions. Uh, uh, there are probably things we've never uh, done. So if you want to try something new, you're welcome. <laughs>